Hallelujah. Can I have some worshipers in the house to raise a high worship unto the Lord? For great and marvelous are his works. Please join me as I worship in the Ghanaian worship style. Monto Yehua Akwaihunyo. Monto Yehua Akwaihunyo. Senen Yonya Nuye Kasi. Ninya Semu Nihi Shabia Ori Maboni B. To ye Monto Mano Nani New My no quarry in she raka on ya unto no man no nani you ma no and she raka unya kupo o kapo no po weku o di esie biya oto. Ninya sebu ni rebia Denna me de betu Unto aye inyomano Nadi yuma yadu she <laughs> Anka onya kupo ishi iraka onya kupo ishi raka onya kupo. Most of the time, women's names are not mentioned in the Bible. Words are not put in their mouth or they are not allowed even to say the word and their achievements are mostly behind the scene in the narratives. When it comes to African women, passages that mention the presence of contributions of African women in the Bible are especially neglected. Perhaps because there are a few African women biblical scholars and also deep prejudice against women. References to African, the African wife of Moses in Numbers chapter 12 um, are so scanty in the Bible that very few critical biblical scholars notice them. The narrator of the text in Numbers 12 also does not mention her name. He does not only refuse to give her a name, there is no single word put in her mouth, despite the dominant and significant role and presence played in the narrative. The Cushite, wife of Moses, as she is called in Numbers chapter 12, is placed as one of the minor figures in the Bible in the book of Numbers. 
whose stories occupy little spiritual space and receive less attention in the biblical material. She is one of the women who are on the margin of Israel, mainly as foreigners who came to be included in the story of the ancient Israelites. Little is known or talked about these women in scripture. However, Miriam, sorry, unlike the Kushite woman, occupy a lot of space and attention in this narrative and in the Bible. As we near the conclusion of our one month long Black History Month UK celebrations, the purpose of today's study is to examine the biblical narrative of the Kushite woman whom Moses married and her marginalization by the author or narrator of Numbers 12, 1 to 10. No name and no word are put in her mouth, as I repeat, despite the significant role her presence played in the narrative. Many modern scholars do not even recognize her as an African woman, despite that she is referred to specifically as a Kushite, which literally means black. This article will also discuss her identity. I mean, this sermon would discuss her identity connotation to her role as the wife of Moses and possibly reasons for the objection from Moses and Aaron and the meaning of a silence in the African and semiotic context. Stay tuned. Join Lady Apostle Diana Adu for an online prayer camp encounter on The Good News TV and on Facebook every Sunday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. BSD and on Wednesdays from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. BSD for a rebroadcast. It's a new day awake your dawn with the word, worship, and warfare. On The Good News TV that is www.goodnewstv.org.uk and on Facebook at Lady Athiana Adu Christo. Shalom and God richly bless you and you are very warmly welcome back. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Um, I want to thank the Dabi uh, TV on YouTube for allowing me to use their instrumentals for the worship. We need more of this. Sometimes it's a struggle to get, I want to do African worship, but it's a struggle to get good intro instrumental so please i'm just encouraging you to put more african worship there it's black history man so it's a privilege for me to worship in the african style and this time i chose the uh, Ghanaian worship style i hope you were blessed by it also um the ghana society the festival is rounding up so they are closing up with the kente festival gala uh, very exceptional to promote the Kinte culture, the African culture in the diaspora that is coming up on the 26th of November next week, Saturday. You don't want to miss it. Please go on Eventbrite, just click Kinte Festival Gala. You'll find the information there. Go on Kinte Festival on Facebook page. You would find the information, the every necessary information there. I think. The, the basic is 30 pounds and the VIP is 50 pounds. It's not just the money. It is coming to participate in fear in things that you are missing when you were in Ghana. There's going to be a Kente fashion show. There's going to be a lot of activities. There's going to be jollof rice. I mean the Ghanaian jollof rice and different kind of African cuisine so please you don't want to miss also i want to take the opportunity to um promote kim rich uh hair saloon on Eaton road in luton for the week that i'm with this hair this beautiful um hair that i'm wearing is um from Kim Rich. As I wait, I also want to tell those people with this kind of hair, I was told that people with this kind of hair are looked upon as albino. It is lovely. Your hair is lovely. I wear different words just because I'm stylish. I, it doesn't mean I want to be a white woman. And when I was wearing this, I said, no, I need to promote those with this kind of hair texture and I mean hair color. 
Yeah, because they say you are treated as albinos and that is a big lie. You are beautiful and then black is beautiful. Can you say it to yourself? Black is beautiful. I'm not saying it. The Bible is saying and tonight we're going to see how God defends blackness, defends a woman who was attacked and the attack came directly against her Africanness and her blackness. And God promptly, so please stop bleaching yourself. Because the Bible, I didn't say it, Songs of Songs, chapter 1 says, Black, I am black and beautiful. And in the Mishnah, the Hebrew biblical interpretation, I don't know whether they want to run away or the Africanize, the Kushite woman of whom I'm going to talk about. But to them, black is Beautiful. So when the Bible calls the wife of Moses black, they suggest it means what? Beautiful. So in some versions, what version is it? I think the tagum of Onkelon, Onkelos, or something like that. One of the pseudo graphic um, translations of the Hebrew Bible says she is fair. Fair means doesn't mean she's white, but that she is beautiful. Black is beautiful. Herodotus says that of Africans, he says, their blackness is beautiful, and that is why Nefertari was idolized and worshipped. As Nefertari was from Nubia, from Sudan, she was from Sudan. Black women are diverse. We've got even black women with this kind of straight hair. So, so we are we are just a beautiful bunch of roses. We don't have just one feel, type of black. We are different. We are black, brown, reddish, and all is what? So when I say black, I don't mean just those that are as dark as the word kusu. And the word for black in the Bible is kusu or kush. Now, um, Sheikh Antip Diop, one of the very first African historians, Senegalese historians, that, that started to take up African civilization and to the the white um, to strip away the whiteness that was given to um, Egypt started here is he said God there was no DNA test there was nothing so he, he had to uh, do some excavations archaeological excavations historical research and one of the ways he was able to find out where some of us West Africans come from or the black people come from was the, the oral stories we narrate. And when I was reading it, I said, whoa, okay, okay. This is what I started about 20 years ago in Italy when I was reading the Hebrew Bible. I saw that most of uh, it, Sheikh Antidiop uses two, two things. The oral language is transmitted and shared among Africans and the language, the closeness, the lateness of their language. So the oral tradition says that we came from the north some from Babylon, some, uh, some settled in Egypt, some settled, and then uh, they moved to Sudan, and from Sudan, they moved to, I'm talking about we Ghanaians, that is what um, uh, the research says, that we migrated from uh, Egypt, dwelt a bit in Sudan, and moved to, how do you call it, to the present day Ghana, and so that is where we come from. So when you read the Bible, and you see Egypt and you see Kush, which I'm going to explain to you today what it is. It means in the Bible, Kush is Sudan. Egypt is what still what Egypt is, but Kush is not just Sudan as it is today. It is Sudan, some part of Aswan, some part of Ethiopia, some part of southern of Egypt. Okay, so that is where we migrated from. It is time that you Africans begin to own the Bible because we've always held the Bible like a foreign person's book. But in there is our history. So black history is biblical history. And biblical history is what? Black history. So that is what we are doing. It's not, um, it, this is not a historical uh, lectures I'm having. This is biblical. Uh, biblical reconstruction and healing space. For we Africans, it's a style. When you read the Bible and you see Hagar, you know she was talking about a black woman. Sad to say, sad to say that Africans, not uh, most Africans are not aware of it and they are uh, not susceptible. They, they are not sensitive. You would see Africans showing 
one night with the queen, the story of Queen Hazard, that's all, Esther, in their churches. And they would not critique, critique the movie. I watched the movie once and I didn't want to watch it again and I won't watch it again. Because this is Christian, Western Christian, uh, born again churches who did that movie. Yet, even though the Bible says that Aswarius ruled from where? India to Kush. He ruled all over the world and the Bible specifically mentions Kush, Africa. There is no one black girl. And the word Kush, as I said, Kush. So when I was, uh, many years ago, when I was trying to trace, because in Italy, I told you, I started as a biblical scholar because I was watching TV in Italy. And they, there was this um, show and they were mocking black people and they said we are so miserable everyone has forgotten about us God has even forgotten about us so much that we are not even in the Bible and that is where some holy anger came on me I was a, I'm a pastor's daughter but I had not heard this uh, how do you call lie before I knew that the Italian society is not overtly it is, it is the racism is just outward there is nothing to hide if you are a foreigner or if you are black, you associated, if you are a woman, black woman associated with prostitution or uh, uh, you, your body is, ex, uh, how, how do you call it? Um, it's exotic. Every white man wants to have you when you are passing on the street. Cars will stop as if you are selling something. That is the culture I met. I remember one time I was going to, I publicized in an, that I wanted a work and I got a work when I went to the place that the person that opened the door was stuck naked. Thank God I went with my husband. This is the mind. Whether you like it or not. Uh, when I was sharing my sermon with my husband, my husband said, do you remember your secretary? Because my secretary is um, Caucasian Italian. And when I go with her to places in the beginning of our ministry, people would leave me and start to talk to her and she would tell them, no, she is the one you should talk to. So it is obviously it is not they suppose that because they've seen a black person, she's ignorant, she's and this is what is in their books. We've got this anthropologist who went to Sudan, Joseph Miles or something like that, and he saw the evidence of the civilization of these Africans and he said, No, black people have two things. Eat, have sex, sleep. They are just lazy. This cannot be black people. And he's not the only one. Uh, last week as I was seven to look for stu to study on this subject which I'm going to present, you've got pastors, you've got preachers, you've got even black people, but mostly Western preachers who say no, Moses' wife who was not a Negro. She didn't, she, I mean, I, I, and this is the leftists that are pushing this. No, this is God. This is God. And as you heard from my introduction, the story of Israel and Africa are so linked. One uh, uh, biblical scholar, uh, David T. Tuesday at Damu, a Nigerian, excellent biblical scholar who defends the Africanness of Africans mentioned in the Bible, says that when you see Kush, Egypt, remember the Bible is talking about black people. Now, whether the color is red or whatever, it doesn't matter. Black people in India, black people in Africa, black people, but these are Africans that migrated to different places. So as I was saying, so our story tells us where we come from. And when I was listening to one of the lectures from this professor, what is his name? I think it's called Charles Finn. He's also, uh, how do you call it, a, an Egyptologist, a black American Egyptologist. He said one of the stories recounted about Sudan or Nubia from the people who migrated there said that the land was like, um, I mean, gold, the dust. They walk on gold like they are walking on the dust, the path. And I said, yeah, this is what I heard when I was a baby, when I was growing up as a young girl. We call it the Kafutro. We were told that where we migrated from, we used to walk. So when you read the Bible and it says the streets are gold, when you read the Bible and it says the streets of heaven are gold, or uh, the, the, how do you call it, the, um, the river in Garden of Eden passes through Africa. The Bible is not lying. God gave us a good land. God gave us a good land, somebody. God gave us a good land and gave us a mandate to 
go into the world and promote his kingdom. Think of food we were told that when we were growing up, we used to play on gold as if it was dust. One of the languages also, as I said, about 20 years I've been doing this study. The Bible calls Moses' wife Kush in Chi. In the Bible, Kush means dark, black. In Chi, which is my language, Kush means what? We say Kusu. Why the name Kusu? That is, he's made his face as if rain is going to fall here, or he's got a cloudy face. It does not connote negative. Or Kusu. Kusu means dark. And that is what we find in the Bible. So, shall we pray? Shall we pray? I'm excited to present this sermon, but I just have a short time here. So, Holy Ghost, help me to use my time very well. So, my head, Kim Rich, please go and get your wings and your braids and do your hair there. Last week I promoted Aurora. This week I'm promoting Kim Rich and go. I will see you at the Kente Festival Gala. Now, shall we attend to spiritual things? Amen. Shall we pray? Holy Father, I want to thank you for you are God and you are good. Please help me to execute your your mission, even as you have sent me to help me and grant my years understanding as you want to. Grant us also not liberation in the mind, but in the soul, in the body, in our social and uh, our spiritual affairs. In your mighty name, I pray. Amen. And everyone say amen. I'm not going to promote my books. You will find the advert at the end of the sermon. The announcer is going to announce it. So, shall we turn our Bibles to Numbers? I am presenting Adonai, the Queen of Cush. Adonai, Queen of Sudan. Adonai. Queen of Kush, Adonai. We remember we are still in our black history men, and that is why I'm presenting this black biblical figures. And if you heard from my introduction, Professor Adamu, Adamu says that one, women are not given a voice. Two, worst of all, if they are Africans, they are not even given their own nationality. <coughs> and this is <coughs> sorry, what we <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Holy Ghost, tell me what we find about this black woman. Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Please take your Bibles and read with me. Numbers chapter 12. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Numbers chapter 12 follows the Exodus story. And in Numbers, God is um, organizing the people he has delivered from Egypt. And we see that in this organization, one of the black people prominently that figures in this story is Phinehas. It's number 25. Phinehas, whose name means black man or Negro, or the black man or the Sudanese. We also see Jethro. Jethro uh, descend from Midian. Midian descend from Keturah, the black woman Abraham married. So these prominently show the priestly anointing. It is Jethro who is telling Moses how to lead as a priest, how to lead as a politician, how to govern. When you go to Numbers chapter 10, it talks about Numbers chapter 11, it talks about the people starting to grumble and mama and God providing them with, um, how do you call it, with uh, manna. Moses is going to God to say, why are you distressing me? Why did you? So Moses is telling us that, the Bible is telling us that Moses is in a distressful state. So this is where Jethro comes in and tells him to choose uh, 70 of the people. And then the Numbers 11, 16 says, God tells Moses to bring the 70 men that Jethro made him choose. And then he will put his spirit upon them. So it is not just choosing them to lead but they need the spirit of God so the context has to do with God in charge of our government and of our social life sometimes we separate our social life from the things then you go to verse 12 the verse 35 says the Israelite journey from Kibroth Hatava to Hazeroth and they remain there Hazeroth means security or establishment 
So it looks as if after the wind had blown Moses a bit, he was beginning to put his foot down as a leader. He was beginning to be established. And that is where uh, number 12 says, And Miriam and Aaron spoke evil against Moses, their brother, because, so the Bible is telling us why they spoke evil against Moses. Moses had just dealt with the church members. And now he comes home and he finds his brother and his sister waiting and they aggressively jump on him because of the Sudanese wife for he had married a Kushite woman. Because of the Sudanese, the God's word version put there because he had married a Sudanese woman. Many Bibles put Kushite woman. The LX except Eugene put Ethiopian woman. But the one that I like most is the Tagum of Jonathan, which is a pseudopigraphic, one of the, I think, Second Temple translations. And he said, and Moshe, because Moshe had married a Sudanese woman, a black woman. And then he puts there, this is not the Zipporah. There's no time for us to read it. If you have time, read it. The Tagum of Jonathan. He say, and Tagum of Jonathan, make sure to put it. And this is not the Zipporah, but the queen of Sudan. Who is this woman? Because the author refuses to give him a name and identifies him just as a black woman. Or that Sudanese woman. When he says Sudanese, it separates her foreignness. Not just her blackness. What is the meaning of the word? He says, and because Moses has married a Sudanese. Moses! Woo! <laughs> the man who was given the law. The word of God declares in the book of John. The law came through Moses. Great came through Jesus. Moses is paired with Jesus in the book of Hebrews. Moses has to be made to understand that he, Jesus is supreme than Moses. Moses the lawgiver. Moses the priest. Moses the judge. Moses the founder of the Jewish spirituality had a black wife. She's not just a black wife. She was African. Kush. Anytime you see the Bible 54 or 55 times that it is mentioned, it refers to the south of Egypt. It refers to Nubia. It refers to Moroi. It refers to Punt. It refers to Sudan. Our present day northern Sudan. Part of Abyssinia, Ethiopia. And Aswan, the south of Egypt. That is where we migrated from. And God, the three, and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? This is telling them that maybe Moses said, it is God who gave me this wife. Leave me alone. I'm promoting my book today. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. We find the same thing in John chapter 12. When Judas is attempting to harass a woman who is serving God. Jesus rebuked him and said, leave her alone. That is a type of the story we are seeing here. Now the man, the, the, the verse 2 says, has he not spoken also to her? So Moses is saying, God said I should marry this black woman from Sudan. The sisters are saying, we to God spoke to her. And God says, you should not marry her. This is the competition that is going on. The prophetic competition. You have two people married. One, Both of them are pastors. The wife says, God spoke to me to do this. The husband said, me to God has spoken to me. Then if God spoke to you and God spoke to me, then let God be the judge. Verse 3. Now the man Moses was very meek and gentle. So he, he, the Bible is telling us that he looked as if he most the sister Miriam, the, who took care of him when he was young. You remember Miriam watched over him. So how do you call it? He, uh, the princess came for him. So she's that kind of elder sister who intrudes in Moses' affairs who has always lorded over Moses and was content to guide Moses as a, a man of God until another woman comes to the house and problem begins. 
It looks as if Miriam's position, Miriam is in, how they, not confident, insecure of her position. The Moses was humble, so he just sat at home and allowed the sister to mouth her, allowed their brother to mouth him, um, allowed them, the, the sister to mouth him. Their mother and their father were dead. If their mother was present, I don't know. The sister is behaving like just her mother, a man of God. But the mother is mouthing your marriage. Your father is mouthing of her. Your mother decides what you do with your wife. When to sleep with your wife. Whether you have to marry your wife. Say, Lord, have mercy. We don't see the woman's voice. Eh? We don't see what the woman did. Eh? All we see in verse 4 is that, verse 3, that Moses was humble. It means Moses just kept on taking the blows of insult, of evil. The Bible says they spoke evil. It means they were cursing him. You are a weak man. You are a stupid man. You are what? You call yourself a man of God. Look at the woman you have gone to marry. Eh? You have gone to marry these beautiful women. Beautiful women are not because she didn't say she was ugly. The word kush among Jews is used for beautiful women. So I told you the Mishnah, the Hebrew interpretation of this verse says that she was kosherous. That means that she was beautiful. A beautiful woman cannot be trusted. You are a man of God. You don't have time to stay at home. How can you trust this woman? I should have chosen her. Yes, many mothers are telling their children who are even pastors and men of God. Why didn't you let me choose the wife for you? And as long as the mother-in-law lives, they will not have peace in their marriage. If this is your condition, then listen, verse 4 says, Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Come out, so... Indeed, the three were prophets. Indeed, God spoke to, was speaking to the three of them. Indeed, the three were leaders. If you read Jeremiah chapter 15, he said, Even if Moses and Miriam stand to pray, I will not listen. So it means that Miriam was a prophetess, an acknowledged prophetess, but she was having a problem. Another woman seemed to have been challenging her position and her authority. And what woman was it? This was not a sassy black woman like Zipporah. So this woman is not Zipporah. Uh, Professor Adam says, and he and many biblical scholars recognize that many times when Western preachers are preaching this, they are in the hurry to say, oh, that this woman is Zipporah. This woman is not Zipporah. And if I have time, I'm going to prove to you that she cannot be Zipporah. And she is not Zipporah. Because the author said, for because he has married a Cushite wife, there is no way in the Bible that Zipporah is identified as a Cushite wife. There is one story, uh, interpretation in the Mishnah, which says that um, uh, when Zipporah saw, when Moses went to uh, Midian, he saw that everyone was black and their ruler was Jethro. Well, that is not what the Bible, we know everyone was black. But Cush, when you go to the, uh, how do you call it, the, the God. Um, the, the strong translation of Kush is saying somebody from Ethiopia. It is true that we, we use a, a word to as a metaphor for someone, but this one is Ethiopia. And many biblical scholars know that when the Bible, with the 55 times it talks about Kush, it refers to Ethiopia. One time, the Bible says, like the tent of Midian, Associating Kush with that is the book of Abad Kudre. Association Kush with Midian. People say the one time, just one time. Fifty-five times the Bible says Kush is Africa, Sudan. One time the Bible associates Midian with Kush. You in Arabia, you say it is Arabia. One time. Meanwhile, we know that the Kushites ruled all over Palestine, even to Arabia, even to Midian. And suddenly, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses and Miriam, Come out, the three of you, to the tent of the meeting. And the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the tent, <coughs> at the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they came forward. And God said, Hear now my word. If there's a prophet among you, I make myself known to him in a vision, here in a vision, and speak to him. But not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted and faithful in my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, directly, clearly, not in the dark speeches. 
for he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed or from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous and as white as snow. And Aaron looked at Miriam and beheld she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh my Lord, I plead with you, lay not the sin. It was a sin upon us as we are foolishly done. Let it not be as one dead. Maybe he had stroke, he had paralysis. Or maybe he, he, was, he had a near death encounter just because, just because he spoke against the choice which was an African woman and Moses cried to the Lord, verse 13, and the Lord and said, heal him, and the Lord healed him. So, because of this, there are many people who hastily jump to say that Miriam was stricken with leprosy, which according to um, some uh, Afrocentrics is a kind of justice, poetic justice of God. If you speak against people God created as black and say God said we have been cursed and our skin is cursed you bring a curse upon yourself I hope you are listening to me so you black people who keep on bleaching yourself please stop it so they spoke against Moses because he had taken the word is taken a Kushite wife who is this Kushite why? Who is this Kushat wife? Let's quickly do some investigations. Who is this Kushite wife? The word is Ha Ha Haisa Ha Kuset. The word is Haisa Ha Kuset. And this is what Professor Yamashu has to say about this narrative. He says that Augustine Talmud that or the, Saint Augustine's letter, he says that we know that this is not Zipporah, even though people think it's Zipporah. Moses' wife is mentioned in Exodus 4 24 26. And then Moses divorces Zipporah. We see that for she is brought back by her father in Exodus 18 2. So Moses sent away, the word means divorce. Moses divorced. Zipporah, the Midianite woman in Exodus 18, his father brought her and her children, Keshon and Eliaiza, back. Yet a number of earlier writers, Augustine Talmud, uh, Tangum, Ankolos, which I said it says it uses fair instead of Kush, suggest, and even Ezekiel, the Trajan, and even Ezra, suggest that this woman was a Midianite not a woman from Africa and the site Abaku chapter 3 I saw the tent of media in distress Kush in distress in anguish most scholars however believe that the Kushite woman was Moses' second wife who have, may have been part of the mixed multitude left who left Egypt Exodus 12 38 Numbers 11 4 the Septuagint, as I told you, translate the word as Ethiopian. And Ethiopian in Greek means the, the sun scorched people, the bent faced people. This is the designation the Ethiopians used to give, the Greeks used to give to Africans. Later Jewish sources provide other, other sources for us which we can use. And that is one that I am using. For example, the Tagum of Jonathan, which I said specifically shares that she is a queen of Sudan and that is why you have that is why you have my my title as queen of Sudan I am opening my notes so queen of Sudan that is what we have that she is oh god what is my notes queen of Sudan queen of Sudan Queen of Sudan. In the Targum of Jonathan, um, let's see if I can quickly read it. Chapter 72, he says that Moses fled from Egypt when he was harassed. There are different, different stories, like Josephus, 
the historian picks from our Tapan story and says that Moses was sent by the Pharaoh to go because of his military valor to go and fight the Ethiopians who were distressing Egypt. And when he went, the princess called Tabi fell in love with him. And uh, this is also cited in the 13th of Jacob of Edisa, which is also who also says the Kushite woman is not Sipora, but the daughter of the king of the Kushite. For Moses was sent as a general by the Egyptian to that place. When you read the, as I said, the Tagum of Jonathan, the Tagum of Jonathan says, and Moses was crowned as king after he had helped the Sudanese to, oh, to take back their city that had been hijacked by Balaam the sorcerer. And that is where they made Moses a uh, king be because they gave him the queen to marry. And what is the name of this queen? Her name is Adonia. I suspect that this woman was converted to Judaism because Adonia means the Lord is my God. And it is a Hebrew name. We have the male, which is Adonijah. I suspect, as, as historians tell us, that when Moses left Sudan, what did he do? He left the wife there. And when they were migrating, when they were on their exodus from Egypt, he brought the woman back. So this is the second wife of Moses. I believe this is the second one of Moses. When it comes to Africa and stories and histories, people try to defame it and say it is a legend. But we know that there is no smoke without fire. So even if it is a legend, there is some truth in it because it has been recounted by so many people. It cannot be true that there wasn't any black woman. And the Bible is telling us this. She is not Zipporah the Midianite. She is the African woman from Sudan. And this is very peculiar because Sudanese queens, because she's a queen from Sudan, Sudanese queens were known as the Kandashis. Have you heard about the Kandashi? It is mentioned in Acts chapter 8. So I can glean upon biblical narrative to suggest who this woman is and identify her. Her name, according to the biblical, extra biblical sources, is Adonai. And she's a queen of Sudan. When you read the Targum of Jonathan, chapter 73, it says that and after 40 years of Moses reigning, he went there when he was 18, they made him king when he was 27, and after 40 years of reigning, that when he was about 66 years, the Lord had decided to hear the cry of Egypt and send Mo and wanted Moses to leave. So he stared the queen, and the queen said, Moses doesn't treat me as a wife. I don't know what I've done. So please, make my son a king. And so they gave Moses gifts and sent him away. What is this narrative telling us? A queen telling the people to make their son a king. It is only found among the Kandashes who wielded such an authority. The Kandashes were the queen mothers who only could choose a king. And at a point they ruled even as female queens in, um, in Sudan, the Kandashes. It is one of these queens who birthed the Kandashi in Acts chapter 8 who sent his emissary to Jerusalem to watch her. So did you see? How did the Kandashi in Acts 8 learn about the worship of God? How? Because she's not the queen of Sheba. It is because in Numbers chapter 8, her great, 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 great grandmother, the Kandashi, was married to Moses. The Bible doesn't tell us that he had children with us, but the Kandashi is telling us that he had children. Who were these Kandashi? They were fiery warriors. We have the Kandashi and Marinas, who withstood Augustus, cut off his statue, and buried it under her temple when Rome wanted to go to take Egypt. When they went, they saw a woman warrior. You know the story of these days about the uh, Togolese female warriors. Uh, the woman king, I watch a little clip of it and I love it. Not because they are violent or worried, but because they know how to speak for themselves. They know how to defend themselves and fight for their land. We see this trait in Nanaya Santua, the Kandashi woman queen. The woman queen who withstood the Britain. When the Ashanti men in Ejusu were cowing down, she rose up. Why? Because
because he descend from this lineage of the queen mothers from Sudan who are sassy, who are brave, who are audacious, who are bashful and who wouldn't accept slavery as their gift. Sit down. Some people think black people just sat down and white people said, come, we will take you and they follow them like zombies. No. And this is the woman God gave to Moses and God defended. So it is very strange that this woman who, who, whose ancestry teaches us that they know how to fight for their people. They install kings. It, Moses became a king because of her. Do you remember Zipporah? She's the one that was teaching Moses to do the right thing. She circumcised. She was a priestess. So God took Moses through Africa to learn from us. To learn from us. But this woman shows a different characteristics. Even though she is a Kandashi and grandmother of the great Kandashi, the queen mothers of Africa who ruled the world. Who ruled the world. And whose descendants include Agamemnon, Tarhaka, Sabako, who you saw in the Bible and a long list of them. Do you know that there were even Nubian queens in Egypt that ruled as pharaohs? We have Nefertiri. You have heard Nefertiri was from Nubia. We have her text troops. Her name is difficult. She was also from Nubia. And they ruled as pharaohs. Her churches even had a, 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 a beard just to, to uh, take on that manly body. These were Nubian, Sudanese, black women that were pharaohs in Egypt. When you read the Bible, so Bible scholars tell us that when you read the 8th century prophets, when you read about any time you see Egypt, Egypt, the 25th dynasty around that time were ruled by Nubian, Ethiopian kings. So when you see Egypt, Egypt actually is talking about Ethiopian kings that were ruling. And this woman descends from this Sudanese, Nubian. Yes, the Bible tells us that she doesn't speak. She doesn't do anything. What had happened? In Ghana, we have a proverb which says that a foreigner, a, a house is not like a box or else we will carry it wherever we go. So I'm bringing it into my context. That is the only way I can read the silence of this woman. I read in the book of Kings, when the prophet goes to the woman of Shunan and then asks them, what do you need? The woman says something that is deep. She said, I live among my people and I am secure and safe. When you live among your people, you feel secure and safe. This woman was caricatured and identified in the book of Numbers. Even though she has a name, Adonia. Even though she has a personality. Even though she has something to say, she's put behind. The queen mother who made kings ends up because of love follows Moses into Israel. And she's treated as a secondary mother. And because of love, why was she silent? We've got the con cultural context in Africa. When a person is silent, it means a lot of things. Silence does not mean stupidity. Silence does not mean consent. Silence can mean wounded, hurt. Silence can mean angry. Silence can also mean I have left my case to God. And I think this woman who had converted into Judaism, this Hebrew Sudanese wife of Moses, when people were challenging Moses, she was the wife, the black hands, the black woman. She was the one that was smooching Moses and telling Moses all would be well. When the people wanted to stone Moses, when the people said give us manna, we don't hear her say give us manna. See, was in her room interceding from African woman. Don't forget, anytime you talk about Moses, remember, there was an African woman who was dressing Moses, who was helping Moses to overcome the strength, to overcome. Look at it. Look at it. This bold woman ends up becoming a silent woman. When you read the scripture, it says, I will put my case before God. I will be silent before God, for he is my defense. Because sometimes when you become a foreigner in a foreign land, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we 
remember Zion. Foreigners are we in the diaspora, black women. Because of love, somebody, some of you have married British citizens and traveled from your country and come. Maybe you are living with your mother-in-law, your sister-in-law. This was the case of Zipporah. The queen mother now has no voice. No, she has no voice. She was sitting with her in the house of the in-laws. They treated her as they want. Foreigner. Israel always has their history about treating foreign women as if they are prostitutes. So there is a scholar who compares Moses' wife to Uzziah's wife. But I'm sorry for you. God came to defend <coughs> this one. She was not a prostitute. <coughs> she came from a long lineage of candashes. She comes from a long lineage of queen mothers who were co regents and at a point who ruled. Yes, Bible says she was silent. Altar or narrative makes her silent. Makes her silent. No, no, no voice. <coughs> because of her foreignness. You remember Ezra to Nehemiah. The people of Israel had to divorce their foreign wives. You remember even in the book of Numbers, where Zimra goes in for a Midianite woman. They don't say she's a Gushai. She's a Midianite woman. <coughs> and Phinehas comes to kill her because they have committed uncleanness. Yet God defends this black wife. So you preacher who is on YouTube telling people that God does not allow intermarriage, may God forgive you before he comes to take you. But the Bible never said that it is people's interpretation that speak against intermarriages. God never accused Moses for marrying. Even if you say Zipporah, so Zipporah is not. So this preacher says Zipporah because he's from the house of Aaron. If you read Balaam the witch was a Midianite. If you read the Midianites in, in Numbers 31, God says, in uh, Numbers 25, God says, get up and kill the Midianites. They were idolaters. So don't come and tell me they were of the they were of the Abrahamic faith, and then they had feared from it as time went on. Not Adonai, the queen. So I've told you, she was a Kushite, she was a woman, and this identity stripped of her and humanity until death. A woman, a black woman, is stripped of her identity and given another identity. We are aggressive, we are sassy, we are ignorant, we are sexy. We are whatever, mummies. We have to take care of white children, white women's children. Till date, people think black women are empty-headed. But our historical, biblical account, archaeological account, tell us that we were queens. We were rulers. We come from a long lineage of Kandashes, which you see in Acts chapter 8. This is the woman whom Moses had taken. She was a black woman. She was an African woman. And the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter, we come into our prayer. Exodus chapter 12, verse 4 through 9. Suddenly the Lord came to Moses, Aaron, and me. Suddenly, God does not waste time. Let's enter to a space of prayer. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. Suddenly, sud if you find your case like that of Adonai, queen of Sudan, who is in a foreign land and is being, a, how, what do you call it? Going through racist experiences misogynistic experiences what belongs to her is not given to her I call upon the God who intervened for Adonai to intervene for you if you think that you are in a marriage where your mother-in-law is deciding the one who should rule and direct your home then lift your voice if you think you are in a marriage that accusations are being pulled that when things are not going this is what was happening 
Things had become beja beja because this is a new nation that is being formed, and things have become beja 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 beja. And people were throwing accusations in the house. That is how it is. When things become beja beja, when things are not going on well, people begin to point finger. Be careful who you are pointing fingers at because that person might be God's choice, and leprosy might be your portion. So one, our lesson is that the woman was from Africa. God came suddenly. Call on God. Call on God. She kept quiet. She said, "I have left my case to God." When the elders came to food, she said, "I release them to God." When the church members came to food, she said, "I release them to God." When the husband was foolish, she said, "I release them to God." When the boss was racist, she said, "I release them to God." There is a time that we speak for ourselves, like Zipporah, the black woman, and there are times that we leave our case to God. Tonight I want to you to do what? Be silent before God. I want to release this adversary that I speaking evil that is placing curses upon your marriage, upon your home, upon your ministry. Release them to God. And God, we call on you. Come suddenly, we are tired. God, come and defend our cause because they are treating us as if we are nothing. Because we are black women. Because we are women. Because we are black. God, come defend. God, come defend. God, come defend. God, come defend. Our children have gone through psychological abuse just because of their blackness. Our wives have gone through psychological abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse. Oh, in Italy, how many times have people not gone through verbal abuse? And now we are going through a biblical, hermeneutical abuse. When the preachers you watch on TV. Refuse to recognize us in the Bible. My God, my God, Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your liberating message, and I thank you for what you have done. Thank you in Jesus' name. I pray, Amen. Certainly, God defends the cause of black women, the righteous cause. Of black women. God bless you and see you same time next week. My name is Lady Apostle Diana Edu. Shalom. What does the Bible actually say about women in ministry? If you have ever asked yourself this question, you can find the answer in this book. A book written by Diana Edu. Author Diana Edu is a devoted Christian, well educated, and well known advocate for God's word to be declared to the world by men and women. With a comprehensive background in biblical study, worldwide ministry, and philanthropic endeavors, she shares her personal experiences regarding women in ministry. If you are a woman who has been stymied from releasing your full potential, yearning to share your God-given leadership role in the church, this book will empower you to launch out with God's blessing. And if you are a man who has often wondered if your thoughts on women in ministry are truly righteous, this book will be a revelation and blessing. Leave Her Alone is now available on Amazon Bookstore. Through the inspiring story of Tabitha narrated in the Bible, Apostle Diana Adu tells how the hurdles we face in life and in ministry leads us to the hope of knowing that there is a God who offers time and over again another chance to live again. To every Shunammite woman, there is an Elijah. To every widow of Zarephatha, there is an Elisha. To every Talita, there is a Jesus, and to every Tabitha. God shall send a Peter. Key themes in the book includes how to identify your call, how to identify destiny or ministerial predators, how to preserve your call from predators, the blessings of serving God, the rewards of the faithful servant, rising above your storms, how to live again. God is ready, willing, and able to help you fulfill your destiny in cooperation and obedience with Him in this time, regardless of your human abilities and qualifications. Your Destiny Maker is a book by Lady Apostle Diana Adu that reveals powerful mysteries within God's Word. To make your calling sure, order your copy now on Amazon or from the author. Join, Join Lady, Lady Apostle, Apostle Diana Adu 
for an online prayer camp encounter on the Good News TV and on Facebook every Sunday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. BSD and on Wednesdays from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. BSD for a rebroadcast. It's a new day awake your dawn with the word, worship, and warfare on the Good News TV that is www.goodnewstv.org.uk and on Facebook at Lady Adriana Adu Christo.